first of all, I would like to uh, welcome you very, very warmly, everyone who came to the conference. The response was amazing, and I'm really flattered to see so many big names from the Taekwondo world, from all the different organizations and groups. My name is Piotr Bernat. Uh, I am hosting this event together with my friend Grzegorz Sokolowski, or simply Greg, who is also co-hosting this uh, conference. And our guest today is Grandmaster uh, George Vitale, who agreed to share some of his vast knowledge about the Taekwondo history. Uh, of course, it would be good to welcome and to introduce uh, all of you, all of these fantastic guests, all Grandmaster Masters practitioners of Taekwondo. But I don't think we'll have enough time. I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you for Grandmaster Vitale to be here. Thank you for all of you who decided to spend this weekend together with us discussing, listening about the history of Taekwondo and discussing the history of Taekwondo. Uh, some technical informations, your microphones are muted. If you will have any technical problems, please use chat features or just unmute yourself by pressing the space. Uh, if you have any questions prepared about the subject of the conference today, please forward them to Greg uh, as he's responsible for the Q&A. Uh, part of this conference uh, and uh, Grandmaster Vitale will answer the questions at the end of today's meeting. If there are many, any problems, please use the chat feature or send me a, pri a private message on Facebook. I am here all the time and I will do my best to, to help you whenever possible. So I will now uh, pass the word to Grandmaster Vitale. The stage is yours, sir. And for everyone, enjoy the enjoy this evening. Uh, or for some, I know it's the middle of the night or early morning down under in New Zealand or Australia. We have people from as far as uh, New Zealand, Australia, Colombia, USA, Canada, to name just a few. And it's great to see that even during these lockdown times, we can meet here regardless of organizational differences and to share our love for our martial art taekwondo. So. Grandmaster Vitala, sir, it's your time now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, so uh, it, it really is my great pleasure, uh, a, a sincere honor uh, to share with you what so many gracious people over the years have shared with me. It, it's actually quite humbling, the response and uh, having so many people uh, book this conference uh, from all around the world is, is quite humbling. Uh, I hope I don't disappoint you, but I will do my best to uh, give a brief overview. I don't know if anybody saw the first lecture either live or uh, on video, but I will, I will use the same slideshow and give the same brief overview. Uh, my, my main goal is to share because the information has to get out there. Uh, th this information, I didn't manufacture. I was lucky enough to have very wonderful people share it with me. Uh, it's been an obsession of mine to, to dig for this information. And I feel that uh, these great pioneers that gave us this wonderful martial art, they should be thanked. So we need to credit them. We need to tell their story. And uh, by recording the history and cementing it for generations to come till the end of time is, is a great way to honor them. I know my life personally has been made uh, so much better uh, because of my involvement with Taekwondo. So I, I want to share, uh, hope, hoping to inform you, I would like to elicit feedback via questions and uh, we can always correct and fine tune anything in the historical record because it, history demands it and it, that's our job to do. The history is, is far from complete. We need to add to it. And if there's a few major points i like you to take away is Taekwondo is not 2000 years old. The history is highly controversial. 
for a myriad of reasons. We'll discuss them. E each reason can be a whole topic for another lecture. So don't be afraid to ask questions. And the, the history has been purposely manipulated by various entities, again, for various reasons. So if we understand this, it will help us sort through all this confusion. And finally, I hope to motivate, because just looking at some of the names, you, you ladies and gentlemen are, are really are present day leaders. You're, you're training the future. And uh, I, I hope to motivate you all to dig deeper so we can all learn more. And that learning is enhanced by the sharing. So that's what I plan on doing. And uh, again, please don't be afraid to ask any or, or uh, any questions at all. So I'm gonna try to race through this overview. Uh, maybe take some notes or if something pops into your head, make sure you ask me about it. So history of Taekwondo, that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, some people say, you know, history doesn't matter. It's a martial art. What, what does history have to do with what I do, you know, in the gym as far as physical defense or sport or, you know, whatever reason why you're training. Uh, but the two main things, Taekwondo is not 2,000 years old. And since there's more than one Taekwondo, logic is simple, everyday common sense dictates that there's going to be various paths of development. So those stories of how that development for that particular style system uh, or aspect of Taekwondo developed will of course have a, a, a different history of that. So we, we have to keep these two main points in mind. And the best way I like to start off with is to acknowledge, yes, Korea, Korea can trace its history maybe to 5,000 years being intact. It is, after all, on a peninsula. So by definition, it's surrounded by three bodies of water. So it's a confined space. And the northern part that's connected to the land is also separated from China and present-day Russia by rivers and very high mountain ranges. So geographically, from a physical sense, it was this isolated, intact area. So its culture does go back 5,000 years. And every single place on the planet can argue that they had a systemized way of protecting themselves. That goes without saying. But we know from a scientific historical research point of view that the martial arts that were indigenous to Korea had virtually nothing to do with Taekwondo. So we don't need to waste any uh, time on that. So uh, if we look at this slide here, we're going to examine the connection of the, that glorious indigenous martial art of the past to Taekwondo today. And there it is, a blank screen put there on purpose because I could not fill it. There is really nothing of substance to put on there because there really is no uh, connection. Really, zero. So if we understand that, we can eliminate a lot of confusion initially. And by uh, manufacturing this story that Taekwondo was 1,300 years old or 2,000 years old, it was part of the goal to confuse us because they did not want the Koreans, very proud people, did not want the true connections to be revealed. So if we continue to feed this narrative, it only hurts our efforts to, to correct the historical record. And uh, as a non-Korean, it's not an issue for me. So uh, I just hope people do realize, yes, Taekwondo had very uh, wonderful indigenous martial arts in the past. They're just really not connected to Taekwondo. It's, it's, it's a fallacy, it's, it's a myth created. Uh, for nationalist purposes uh, uh, for the Korean people. If you have the opportunity to go to the Taekwondo Wan in Korea, in South Korea, in Muju, it is absolutely a phenomenal place. And their history room in their museum starts off with the martial arts of the past. And I was so excited to see that they make no connection. They come out in the very next wall where it's the history of Taekwondo and they show where it started. So. 
if it didn't come from these martial arts in the past, where did it come from? So I answer that question with these graphics up here. There's five images and the Korean Peninsula on the bottom one side. And on the other side is the Korean flag on, on the, the chest at the, the heart area of, of a Korean. So it, it comes from Korea, from really from the heart of the Korean people. And if you really want to know where it came from, you look at the image on the top row in the middle. Does anybody know what that image is? If you do, just unmute and shout it out. The uh, ROK military flag, is it? Uh, that's correct. It is the uh, Rock Army flag, the Republic of Korea, South Korean Army flag. That's where Taekwondo began. Excellent. Okay, so uh, the other thing is Taekwondo did not come from the five original Kwans, at least not directly. So what the Korean, uh, uh, the original five Kwans were doing, and original defined by opening prior to 1950. June 25th, 1950, the onset of the all-out invasion of the South by the communist forces of the North took place, and it caused a lot of chaos. So by definition, original Kwan means the, the schools that opened prior to the Korean Civil War. And what they were doing was teaching karate that came overwhelmingly from Japanese sources. There was some very minor Chinese martial art influence. They called it names like Kang Sudo, Wa Sudo, Kwan Bok, Tang Sudo. And uh, each of them in their own way, like you ladies and gentlemen do in your prospective schools, you add your individual preferences and focus to your teaching which makes your students somewhat unique. So this was very similar to what was going on there, but it was basically karate and basically rudimentary karate, elementary, very, very beginner type of karate. And they, of course, utilize karate kata. So we know Taekwondo is not 2000 years. Where, where did it come from? Uh, these are the names of the five original Kwans. So Taekwondo did not, come directly from these original Kwans. And remember, these are not Taekwondo Kwans. These original Kwans are Korean karate Kwans. They were Koreans teaching karate in Korea from mostly Japanese sources. So Taekwondo did not come directly from there. Where did it come from? There's a, a, a picture of seven Korean gentlemen here. Uh, no Bin Jik, Lee Won Guk, uh, Yoon Byung In, Chung Sung Sup, Che Hung Hee, Yoon Kyung Byu, and uh, Wang Ki. So these are the seven Koreans that studied martial arts abroad during the occupation period. This means they learned martial arts outside of Korea prior to 1945. August 15th, 1945, the Empire of Japan unconditionally surrendered, ending World War II and ending the occupation that Korea suffered with for over a half a century. So these gentlemen learned what was basic rudimentary karate with some Chinese influence. And they learned it in karate, uh, sorry, in Japan, with the exception of Grandmaster Wang Ki, the founder of the Budokwan. He learned it, he learned some Chinese martial art uh, via self-reporting, that's the source, in Manchuria during the occupation. He also, through self-report, uh, indicates he had access to karate books at the railroad library, and he learned the karate uh, from those uh, textbooks as well. So these are the seven people that were responsible for those five original Kwans, and then the older Kwan, which was not, it was not an original Kwan because it opened officially in 1954. It is what I call one of the six early Kwans. The five original Kwans with the older Kwan is the six early Kwans. And all six of these Kwans, including the older Kwan, was teaching karate, plain and simple. Something had to take place to bring it to what we know as Taekwondo today. So uh, to reiterate, and, and again, the 
title this slide, Intellectual Honesty Requires Us to Consider These Things. The five original Kwans did a slightly, you know, Korean influenced form of karate. The training was very limited and was essentially basic rudimentary karate. Therefore, again, going back, if you wish to consider the five Kwan founders as the founders of Taekwondo, you have to be honest and step back to Japan and credit Funakoshi Sensei, the Shotokan founder, karate, as being Taekwondo's founder. But we obviously, in 2020, do not do Shotokan karate. So it's, it's ridiculous to think the original five Korean karate kwans were the ones that created Taekwondo. So these, and I don't want to, uh, nothing in, in that I said should be seen as negative or derogatory or diminishing in any way their enormous contribution because they played a vital role in creating the second generation students who went on to create the various styles of systems of Taekwondo. So now we go into the different types of Taekwondo. The first martial art in Korea to apply the name Taekwondo, first, original meaning first, was in the Rock Army at the Otakwan under General Choi, who conceived the name and it became known as military Taekwondo, or it was Taekwondo, the martial art that was done in the military. Of these seven gentlemen that I had the pictures of, only two of them, these first generation leaders, these Kwan founders, only two of them played any direct role in Taekwondo's development. And of course, they were assisted by their students, which are considered, or I label, the uh, second generation leaders. They were the juniors and the followers of these first generation Kwan founders. None of the second generation studied in, uh, in Japan. They learned their karate in Korea from Koreans. So we then have to then deal with which Taekwondo are we talking about? I, I feel, and this is just subjective, so it's certainly open to be modified and adapted as anybody else sees it. There are three system styles or branches of Taekwondo. The first one, which was General Choi who conceived the name and began uh, in 1946 teaching karate on Jeju Island. He met up with uh, a young lieutenant, Nam Tae-hee, who was a superman and one of his protégés and, and juniors from the Chung Kwan Han Cha Kyo, who was a uh, sergeant first class. These three people became the first, what we would say, the first three teachers or masters of Taekwondo. General Choi, Colonel Nam Tae Hee, and the sergeant Han Cha Kyo. They met on Jeju Island. He recruited them to teach karate to his soldiers. And uh, one, they, after the training uh, ended and the div uh, division was formed, it relocated from the island to the mainland and to celebrate the one year anniversary of its formation, which coincided with the birthday celebration of the president, these uh, titans, these iconic people, put on a Korean karate Tang Sudo demonstration for the president. And the way it goes is he exclaimed, oh, this is Taekyeon. And that was the motivation for General Choi and a Colonel Nam, a, a young lieutenant or captain at the time, uh, searched the Chinese dictionary and they came up with the new word of Taekwondo. So that is the first uh, style or system of Taekwondo. And then the second one began in the five Kwans, where the second generation leaders created something that they called Taesudo. And uh, that was on the civilian side. So some people will call it civilian Taekwondo, which in, then in turn became a WTF or Kuki or Olympic sport Taekwondo. And uh, that is the most prevalent, the most powerful uh, uh, Taekwondo body in the world. Uh, it's the one that has uh, did a miracle in getting into the Olympics. And then finally, the third one is a little like a catch-all term independent Taekwondo. That's all the other uh, uh, strains out there that do their own thing in their own way, but apply the Taekwondo name. And uh, number three is a very broad umbrella term. Uh, we Certainly, uh, 
that we can go on forever and ever on each strain, but we won't. We'll, we'll focus on uh, the, the main two that also have organizational uh, solidarity uh, in, in their leadership. So it obviously comes from Korea. It was created by Koreans who learned martial arts abroad, mostly from Japan or Japanese sources, and had some Chinese uh, martial art influence. So, uh, and the second generation, as I said, they learned in Korea from Koreans who studied outside of Korea. Here I have a chart up there, the divide happened. So uh, maybe that slide is not labeled correctly. The divide happened, yes, but the divide happened somehow might imp uh, implicate or give the impression that they were together. They were never together. They were never together. There were attempts to bring people together and they started as early as 1946 and they were not successful. And they had repeated attempts and they were not successful. So I put here 1959, Korean Taekwondo Association was formed, short-lived partial unity. And we can expand on that later. Uh, two years later, 1961, Military coup happens, the Korean Taesudo Association is formed, and we have unity, the, the beginning of unity. In 1965, General Choi changes the name of the Korean Taesudo Association back to Taekwondo when he was elected the third president. This was uh, something that, in retrospect, as a historian, I say, very big mistake. He should have let them be Taesudo, and today we'd have the World Taesudo Federation, and Taesudo would be the uh, Olympic sport, the martial sport of Korea. Taekwondo would still have the International Taekwondo Federation, and it would be the martial art of Korea, and we would not have uh, a lot of the bickering that we do today. So uh, since General Choi was so forceful in pushing his way, they pushed him out of the KTA. And uh, uh, his one-year term ended, and uh, he went on in January of 1966, was replaced by Grandmaster No Bun Jik, the uh, original Kwan founder from the, of the Song Kwan. And uh, in March of 1966, General Choi forms the ITF in Seoul, Korea. And of course, Seoul, Korea is in South Korea, the Republic of Korea. Uh, fast forward another five years to 1971. It's January 29th. Dr. Kim Won Young, a very, very, very uh, well-educated, highly influential, powerful politician, KCIA operative, you name it. I mean, he had so many responsibilities. Uh, I think six languages he spoke. Uh, he's tasked with becoming the uh, president of the KTA. And uh, uh, there's indication that one of the reasons why he was sent was to uh, clean up the mess. And the mess was, uh, from the point of view of many in Korea, uh, General Choi is doing. So 1972, General Choi exiles himself to Canada. This is at the height of the Park Chung-hee military dictatorship brutality. This is, this is another example of how, if you want to understand the history of Taekwondo, you have to step outside of the Taekwondo world and go into the Korean political and history world. Everybody knows 1972 was the height of the brutality, if you study anything with history. Park Chung-hee suspended the assembly, uh, uh, canceled the constitution, uh, uh, declared martial law, and he did all these things several times, but he did them all again in 72. And it resulted in him basically being made president for life. And General Choi was a very, very outspoken critic of Park Chung-hee. General Choi served on the military tribunal back in the 1940s that arrested and convicted Park Chung-hee for being a communist traitor and a uh, Japanese collaborator during the occupation. Uh, so they never got along. They were never going to get along. General Trey never supported him as president and he fought with him right from the beginning, which was one of the reasons why he was removed from a very powerful position in the military and sent to Malaysia to be an ambassador. So Park Chung-hee and his inner circle made up the, of the 8th Military Academy, uh, could solidify their control. So he leaves to, uh, for his safety in 1972. 
November 30th, 1972, the Kukiwan opens up to KTA, and it, it was its uh, central gymnasium. 1972, the KTA hosts the first Taekwondo World Championships in Korea. Notice that was not the first World Taekwondo Federation World Championships because the WTF was not yet formed. At the conclusion of the tournament, the member nations that arrived to participate in the championships, their delegates uh, uh, had a meeting, and that's when they formed the WTF. It's a big mistake to think the WTF was formed because General Trey took the ITF to Canada. Very big mistake that especially ITF people make. And we can get into that later. I hope people ask a question on that. That could be a whole lecture in and of itself. The following year, the ITF holds their first world championships in Montreal, Canada. In 1978, the Quans were officially retired. They were given Arab, uh, Arabic numbers and they were rolled into the Kukuan. This is when unity was realized. That was August 7th, 1978. Two years later, General Choi introduces Taekwondo to North Korea and the divide is cemented. Why is the divide cemented? Uh, because that was seen as a very patriotic act, visionary by some, including myself. And it was also so seen by Koreans in the South as uh, treason. Uh, he was looked at as a communist traitor who committed treason by bringing Taekwondo to North Korea. And people have to understand in 1980, it was a capital offense for a South Korean to go to North Korea. But General Choi was not a South Korean. He was a Canadian citizen in good standing. He went with his Canadian passport. And uh, originally what was supposed to happen was Park Chung-hee was assassinated by his own KCIA director, October 26, 1979, the same day that uh, uh, An Chung-gun uh, assassinated Hirobu Miito, uh, you know, 79 years, uh, 69 years later. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that's ironic, it was on that day. But uh, General Choi, the, the embassy people, the South Korean embassy people in, in Argentina, uh, came to their celebration. They were talking about the news. Uh, they were saying, asking to get General Choi's reaction. Was he going to go back to Korea? So the plan was they were going to reintroduce the ITF to South Korea and also bring the ITF demonstration team to North Korea. And he could do this as a Canadian citizen. The South Koreans that were now expatriates living abroad as, as uh, citizens of the UK in, in, in the case of Grandmaster Rishi Ha uh, and uh, others, would uh, uh, not have any problem from the South Korea because they were going under their other passports and it was not a political mission. But that really cemented the divide. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But for those of you around with the ITF in those days or the WTF in those days, you will see how General Choi tried to get the ITF into the Olympics. So he fought the WTF and how the WTF fought the ITF and all this bickering would go back and forth. It really, really created a lot of animosity, but the divide was cemented. So I'm gonna sum up and we're gonna open it up for whatever questions you have. Uh, I rushed through this, but I actually think I might've added some additional details I didn't the first time, only because I needed to uh, maybe spur additional questions so we can dig deeper on these things. So Taekwondo is not 2,000 years old. It was named by General Choi Hong Hee, who oversaw the development in the Rock Army as a martial art. And that, that system he was developing centered around his Korean Taekwondo patterns. About 10 years later, uh, he convinced the civilians to use the Taekwondo name after they had already united together under the Taesudo label because they were coalescing around new unique sports sparring rules. So in 1965, you had two distinct activities that were different in so many ways, sharing the same name, big problem. The political climate of the times of its development, those turbulent times, there were three military generals that ran Korea, two of them via a military coup. The other was the, the third and last military dictator, No Tae Wu. He was, he was basically placed by Chung Doo Wan, the second military dictator, because Chung Doo Wan knew when his term was up, he faced big problems from the South Korean government because of his brutality. And 
he knew this would happen and he was right. So he made sure his right-hand man, one of his main henchmen, No Te Wu, took over and he did. So what happened when No Te Wu left office, even though he was elected, after he left the office, the first civilian democratic elected president of Korea commissioned a truth and reconciliation commission patterned after the one that happened in South Africa when they finally uh, were able to throw off the disgusting shackles of apartheid. And they searched every stone. And Chung Dewan and No Te Wu were sentenced to death for crimes against the Korean people. So if you don't understand how heavy these things are, you will fall for all the nonsense that the Taekwondo people talk about when they say Geno Choi was a communist traitor who committed treason. Okay, yeah, if you feel that, fine. I, I think it's absurd, uh, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't even scratch the surface. It doesn't even scratch the surface. This man today in South Korea is being uh, rediscovered, not by Taekwondo people. Yes, the Taekwondo people are doing it, no question. But academics are doing it in the university level that have nothing to do with Taekwondo, and they are exploring his contributions as an outspoken critic to the military dictators, as a patriot for his, his uh, insurrection against the Japanese colonial government during the occupation. And uh, they realized the great things he did in promoting Korean culture and history by spreading Taekwondo globally. So uh, how Taekwondo grows going forward and to the extent how it grows uh, is really up to us. We, you know, uh, how are we gonna cooperate? How do we teach our students? So uh, with that, I, I gave you this very rushed brief overview and I hope that it will uh, spur uh, a lot of questions. So with that, I'm going to just wait for you guys. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Grandmaster Vitala, for this for this overview of the beginnings of Taekwondo and for this lecture. Uh, I know from uh, from Greg that there are already two questions. Uh, if there will be, if there if there are any others. Please free to uh, feel free to send them to Greg by chat, or just after we discuss the first two, we can proceed and and get some more. Greg, can you help us with the questions? Uh, yes, of course, uh, not a problem. So the first question came from Mr. Trevor Hill. Uh, I don't know, Trevor, would you like to ask it directly, or do you want me to read it? Okay, he's shaking his head, so I will <laughs> ask the question. Okay, so his question was, uh, he says, it's not strictly uh, Taekwondo that, uh, related, like historically connected with this particular uh, seminar, uh, but what do we know of the real history of Huarang? Uh, because as he says, Alex uh, Gilles, I think it's pronounced, book basically, yes, Alex, yes. mm -hmm. uh, basically trashes the idea of them being warriors. So the question, uh, what do you know of the real Huarang? Okay, so this is a very good question and people might th not think it's related, but I think it is spot on. It is spot on, it is absolutely related because it goes to what? It goes to the same uh, mythical reasons, why, nationalist reasons why these myths were uh, manufactured and spread. So. The Wadong group did exist. There is no real academic research that indicates they were any type of warriors. Uh, they, there are many different ways that they are explained, but does it, uh, just unmute and yell out the answer if you know it. Does anybody know the first Korean Taekwondo pattern that was developed? Oh, answer. Wadang, yes. Now, do you think it's a coincidence that Wadang was the first pattern developed? Well, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. Now, there is a, uh, uh, when you look at any of General Choi's books from 1972 forward, there is a doctor that was a lieutenant colonel in the army. 
And in the 1940s, Dr. Sigmund Rhee, the first president of Korea, tapped this historian to write things about Korea's history, about Korea's past. And he was the one that wrote the initial uh, legend of the Warang warriors. Uh, General Tring knew him very well. I have... I cannot prove definitively that General Choi picked this to be the first pattern, but knowing General Choi, knowing how his brain worked, following and studying things that he did, it's quite clear to me that he created the first pattern, Wadong, after these warriors, supposed warriors. And when you search the record of, of the Wadong, you will see most most of what is out there is written by martial artists not historians not academics who who you know i'm crazy the stuff that i have dug through to come up with you know i i don't have any notes i just talk because i've d jumped so deep into this material for so long it's in my head. I can't get it out. It's like General Choi, 24 hours a day, Taekwondo history, Taekwondo history. So he had a relationship with this man. He comes to the United States and he uh, attends advanced military training with the, uh, General Che, uh, che Duk Shin, his, his uh, self-proclaimed blood brother. And guess what happens when he's in the United States? He's traveling in between uh, training as a tourist. And I have his photo albums. I have him at the Statue of Liberty. I have him on Fifth Avenue, Manhattan, the Empire State Building, the Lincoln Memorial. He is amazed. Look at this obnoxious patriotic country to have street names and stuff named after their founding patriots. So this is what I believe gave General Choi the motivation. And Wadong was the first one that was used. So, uh, did they have some kind of martial arts training? Did some of them become involved in the military? I think from uh, the limited history, we know that that is accurate. Were they a rival to the Japanese samurai warriors? No, they weren't. There's nothing in, the, uh, in, in any scholarly research that indicates that's the case. So uh, Alex Gillis, I know very well. He's an independent Taekwondo man with both connections to ITF and WTF. He's an investigative journalist. If you have not read his book, please do so. I highly recommend it. I don't know, uh, I don't know four dozen or more interviews he did, over 400 footnotes. So you can check. He uses a minimum of two or more sources for every claim that he puts forth. So, uh, I think that uh, my colleague and friend, Mr. Gillis, is spot on with the Wadang warriors. That, that is, uh, I, you know, people think unrelated. I think it's directly related. Okay. Thank you, sir. So you see, I will go deep with these answers. So don't be afraid to ask. If I don't give this in-depth response, you're not going to grasp. So if you have to ask follow-ups, fine, but, but keep digging. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, another question uh, is from Master Sunday, I think it's pronounced. Uh, it's, uh, well, basically a general question. How do we define Taekwondo? If you could relate to that. Sure, okay, so um, very, very basic question. How do we define Taekwondo? Well, there is a definition, and uh, the, the definition, so we know Taekwondo is made up of three Chinese characters. So people think it's foot, fist, and mind, and it's wrong. Uh, that's why it was critical when General Choi asked the first president of Korea to write the calligraphy with the Taekwondo name, that he did it in Chinese. For those who've been to Korea, or you just might know, even if you know the pattern Sejong, Korea uses a phonetic alphabet. Hangul is a phonetic-based alphabet. So when we discovered the lost or forgotten pattern Unam, when I would show uh, somebody the Korean Hangul for Unam, I would say, what is this? And they would say, Unam. I said, I know, that's, what it, that's how you say it. That's how you pronounce it. What is it? They don't know. 
How do they know? They have to go back to the underlying Chinese characters that say Unam to give it the meaning. So Taekwondo is not, does not mean foot, fist, mind. The Te means a foot elevated off the ground. If you just isolate that character, you will see that Te is made up of two Chinese characters joined together. One is the character for foot. The other is the character for elevated or off the floor. So General Choi would say off the floor, like for stomping, stamping, kicking, jumping, flying, or whatever, right? But the, the visual picture, if you just ask somebody that reads Chinese and you isolate that character, it's very important you don't do it Taekwondo together. You have to isolate that, that character and ask a native speaking Chinese person that's educated because it's a, it is a rare character. They will tell you it's a foot elevated off the floor. I did this by going to a library where the chief librarian was uh, a native Chinese and uh, very educated in uh, Chinese characters. She confirmed this to me. Then I went to a uh, students of mine were Chinese and uh, their, their students went, their children, my students, went to Chinese language school. Uh, and I asked them, to find this out, and that's the answer I got. Uh, and I've asked this in Korea, and I've asked this of, of other people as well. So it is a foot off the ground. So it's not a noun, it's more like an action word, a verb. And the Quan we know is a fist. It's a hand rolled into a fist. And as Nam Tae said and General Choi said, a fist denotes strength, right? So they thought about what do they use, and Quan was already widely used, Quan Bok. So they used the te, which they came up. Some people even think General Choi put these two characters together to create the te character. But so the te and the quan is, is the hand rolled into a fist to denote strength. And then the do is not do, it's dao, like Taoism, Taoism, right? So if you isolate the Chinese character, it's the character that, that uh, signifies this Asian belief system. And what is this belief system? It's not mind, it's a belief system in moral living. A strict adherence to a moral conduct that is seen to be uh, benevolent in a way, M my words. But so it is, it is uh, a foot elevated off the floor and a, a fist for strength uh, with this moral guidance to live, live a good life. And then it has to be put together. So how you, how you put it together and how you explain it to people has a lot of um, uh, flexibility. I was just reading a scholarly uh, peer reviewed research on this very topic. And the uh, authors, uh, one of them I know very well, uh, he uh, was saying that in searching for definition of Taekwondo, because Taekwondo is so popular, most of the definitions you get revert back to General Choi's meaning, because that's how inf influential he is. That's why you have to isolate the characters themselves. So that's what the literal translation means, and how you put it together, and, and what you, you know, is it a martial sport? Is it a martial art? Is it a way of life? To me, Taekwondo is a way to a better life. And when you look at General Choi's guidance, his moral culture, his philosophy of Taekwondo, I think it gives you great insight to what he was thinking and how he applied that name. And I very much go along with, with uh, his application, including the way it's written with the dash or the hyphen, separating the physical and the, and the, the mental or spiritual part. But good question, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question is from uh, Master Michael Munyon, uh, and it goes, uh, can we get history on the difference uh, or split between Mudo Kwan ta Taekwondo and Mudo Kwan Tang Sudo? We certainly can, and it's a, it's a very, very good question. So Mudo Kwan is the name of the Kwan, the school that uh, Grandmaster Wang Ki um, opened or, or started to teach at. He used November 9th, 1945 as the opening date. Other people put it as 1946 or even as late as 1947. I don't get bogged down into exact uh, 
starting points because that's more like, oh, this guy was a nobody. He's not important. He wasn't as early as we are. And I don't play those kind of games. But Mudaquan was the name he gave to his school. And the art that he taught, he called Wasudo, which turned out to be very unpopular. Uh, it didn't have the martial art connotation or connection. And uh, upon meeting uh, Grandmaster Lee Wang Guk of the Chung Duquan, uh, Grandmaster Lee, and they, and they don't know why uh, that he um, chose Tang Sudo, because most people were using Kang Sudo. And he was seen to have been very, uh, I don't want to say, uh, he was seen to, to he was labeled a, a Japanese sympathizer or a Japanese collaborator. And there is some really good evidence that uh, that was the case. There is also some really outlandish claims that apparently I think are true, but I have not been able to uh, confirm it, uh, that would really uh, uh, paint him in a, in a very unfavorable light. Uh, and and th these are the uh, reasons why he had to flee for his safety to escape political persecution during the Korean Civil War. But he, for some reason, chose to use the name Tang Sudo, which was a slap against his, his uh, uh, karate roots. Uh, and it was what they say happened priv uh, previously when karate was moved from Okinawa to mainland Japan, they dropped the Tang Sudo name and they used the, uh, they dropped the way of the China hand to empty hand. And that's the difference, Tang Sudo and Kang Sudo, one is empty hand, one is uh, China hand. So uh, uh, Lee Wang Guk goes back to using the Tang, Tang Sudo name. And surprisingly, uh, Wang Ki picks it up, uses it, and is the one really, he really is the one that has popularized that name because he stuck with it for a long time. And, uh, and a big faction under him did as well. Later on, he rejected th uh, that and used the Subak Do because he felt that was more Korean. Uh, Grandmaster Wong Ki was, in my estimation, the greatest Korean martial artist after General Choi in terms of influence, uh, global, global uh, uh, connectivity and following, uh, the books he wrote. I mean, he wrote a book in the 1940s. In 1949, I think it was, he wrote. He wrote a, a Wasudo book in 1949. In 1958, a Tang Sudo book. This is before General Choi wrote his 1959 book. So, so I don't want anything I say about Grandma Sawang Ki to be seen as derogatory in any way because I very much respect him. I actually move Kwan roots myself. But Wang Ki, Dr. Yoon, General Choi, and No Bin Jik had a big problem. These are the four first generation leaders in the 60s that uh, did not follow, did not approve of, did not like the sport emphasis that the second generation, their students, their juniors uh, wanted. So this created a lot of problems in Korea. It cr created a lot of personal problems for, for Grandma Sawan Ki. My follow-up lecture was, was devoted entirely to this uh, a segment of Taekwondo history. So I really went into it very deeply. But to get uh, uh, back to uh, that particular specific question, Wang Ki, for many reasons, did not want to participate in the Tae Sudo movement. So he broke and he suffered for it. Oh, the, the backlash from the military dictatorship was terrible. He was under constant surveillance. They canceled his monthly publication. They uh, uh, relieved him of his teaching responsibilities at the uh, South Korean Air Force. Academy uh, at the National Police School and uh, wouldn't issue visas for people come in to attend his events, wouldn't issue passports for his people to go. He was not allowed to travel abroad until 1979. Remember what happened back in 1979? Park Chung Hee, shot and killed by his own KCI director at Point Blank Range, assassinated. That's when Wang Ki gets freedom of movement again. So, see, General Choi complains about the same thing and he's somehow vilified. This stuff was real, ladies and gentlemen, and Wang Ki is living proof of it. And God bless Grandmaster Wang Ki because he stayed in Korea. He had no availability to flee, and he fought in the court system and prevailed. And what happened was General Choi in January 1965 gets elected third president of the Korean Taesudo Association. 
in March, March 18th, 1965, they assemble and they try to get, bring in the Murakwan into this uh, a Taysudo Association. Uh, Wang Qi was going to acquiesce. Uh, the next day he said no. And that meant now General Choi went to his people and basically saw some very good martial artists there and appealed to them and they abandoned their teacher. And that's when the split happened, Murakwan Tang Sudo and Murakwan Taekwondo. So you will see in 1965, that very real split happened. That split also happened in the Jido Kwan where Dr. Yoon kept with Wang Ki with his martial art focus and uh, Grandmaster Lee Chung Wu, who's the, the most pivotal WTF martial artist as far as leadership goes. He is the most pivotal person. Uh, he split from the Jido Kwan. So those two Kwan split at that time with the whole uh, coming together under the Taesudo label that in a couple of months, General Choi was able to switch back to uh, Taekwondo name. So that is a, a very good question. And uh, hopefully th the more depth I added to it reinforces this political climate that was happening uh, uh, in the dictatorship back in South Korea. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so now actually lots of questions came up. Uh, so I will choose the next one. Uh, Mr. Brandon Dugan, um, the question is, the streets of Seoul are also named for Korean patriots. And uh, the, the question is, was that a recent thing? And did they inspire General Cho's naming of the tools? Is it possible that his promotion of the history in the tools inspired the street names? Okay, so uh, there's no way that I can say one way or the other, which came first, the chicken or the egg. We do know during the occupation, the Korean education was banned. They had to learn Japanese. General Choi was forced to take a Japanese name, Nishiyami. Uh, they suffered a great humiliation and de degradation being... Uh, subjugated to second-class Japanese citizens by a power that they didn't elect, didn't adhere to, that had no business being in Korea. So this goes back to that core issue. When Korea was liberated in 1945, two very important things. Sigmund Rhee, uh, they were liberated in 1945, the southern half was a uh, military occupation governed by the U.S. Army. And on August 15th, 1948, the military occupation government of the United States uh, gave over control and the Republic of Korea was officially formed, August 15th, 1948. I'm sure they use August 15th because that was also the, the, the third year anniversary of the liberation from Japanese colonial rule. And then I don't know if it's a month later, something similar happened in uh, Pyongyang in North Korea, where uh, the Kim Il-sung government was officially sanctioned by the Soviet Union, and they started their uh, uh, withdrawal as well. And these things then uh, tragically put in place what would then lead to the Korean Civil War. But one of the things that uh, Dr. Rhee did as president of South Korea, the first Korean president, he put forth a policy that it was not allowed to promote anything Japanese related. That's when he gets this uh, colonel, uh, the historian in the military, to... Uh, write these things about Korean history, because remember, they would, it was eradicated. So these things all started happening at that time. I believe the motivation for the patterns was from when General Choi was from, 19, from uh, 1949 to when the outbreak happened and the US military rushed him to go back home. He was here for a year. Uh, two different trainings, one in Fort Benning in Georgia and one in Fort Riley in Kansas, I believe. Uh, 
And in between, he was in Washington, D.C., my hometown, New York City, and so forth. And I believe this is where he got the motivation. Uh, this was relayed to me by one of the pioneers that was very close with General Choi, that that's where the motivation came from the patterns. And uh, I was with my friend and colleague, Dr. Zibi Crook, who lives now in Korea. And he might be very good at, at help, helping getting some of uh, these answers of when the street names were. But we were in the area in Nansan, where I'm driving down the street with him, the road with him in his car. And we're talking and I look up at the sign and I see the sign. Gaybeck Row, and, and he said, and the Korean ladies that were with us in the car, his English students, uh, they explained, yeah, this was the area where Gaybeck was from. That's where he lived, in that area. So Gaybeck, uh, you know, was this great general. What also was in that area? Well, in 1961, Grandmaster C.K. Choi, Choi Chang Kyun, he is a young man. Uh, uh, his teacher was General Wu Jung Lim, and uh, he went to Grandmaster Choi's parents and said, you know, uh, he's got to go into the military with the mandatory service, but if you let him in with me, I can hook him up with Taekwondo. He'll be very safe. It'll be a really nice position. And where does he get assigned? He gets assigned to the Army Recruit Training Center in Nansan. Who is the general in charge of the Army Recruit Training Center? Anybody say Che Hong Hee? Yes. <laughs> Two-star Major General Choi Young Hee. So General Choi is, is now stationed in this area when Gay Beck was from. So to me, is it coincidence that the pattern he devised in 1961 with Grandmaster C.K. Choi was Gay Beck? No, not at all. So I think there's a lot of overlap, and I don't know if it's possible to determine what came first, the chicken or the egg. But certainly somebody can research when in Korea did they start naming these roads after uh, these Korean patriots? Uh, for people who have been on the tool tours, I was on the first one and I was on a, a subsequent one with uh, my friend Master Stuart Anzo and a bunch of his, his gang. And I know some of them have uh, logged on here. Uh, when you go around, there's all these statues and monuments and things. So yeah, so these were done. Uh, and uh, I don't know how much of they, they made an impact, but there's no question that General Trey was a fierce patriot. He was a, a tremendous nationalist. He had great pride and love for his country. So I am sure that that had a part, part, uh, uh, played a part in it. And then in the 1960s, Park Chung hee adopted the Japanese model of using sport and some of these other things to promote uh, pride. He put a lot of resources into sports. And he followed the Japanese model. This was why the uh, military government sponsored the Kuki Taekwondo Goodwill Tour that General Trey led in 1965 that went literally all around the world. Uh, that's why the Taesudo Association was set up. They started dispatching people abroad. The ITF was set up. Uh, that's why when Young Kim came, that's why the Kuki one was built. So all of these things were done because the leaders of Korea knew they had to promote this image. And, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, I have a Samsung phone. I had a, a, a Hyundai uh, vehicle. Uh, uh, my TV's Korean, uh, all kinds of electronic devices from Korea. In the old days, Korea's first export, plain and simple, Taekwondo. If you go to any Korean embassy or a consulate around the world, they have people that are hired to, to promote Korean culture. And uh, they will all tell you Taekwondo was the first Korean wave. Uh, and it, it, it's held in very high esteem by the Korean people. And again, this is the vision of General Che. It's, it's, it's exciting now that people in South Korea are, are starting to uh, realize that and appreciate it. But uh, that, that's a, a, a good question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm not sure how much time do we have uh, for all the questions because there are quite a few of them. I'm here for as long as you want me. People can leave anytime they want. They got to go to sleep. They got to go to work. They feed the dog, whatever. They got to go to get milk for mommy for the little babies. I don't care. So it's fine by me. Just ask them and you, I won't take offense. I won't even, it doesn't matter when you drop out or it doesn't matter at all. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so I have joined some uh, questions because uh, they were repeated by some or some yes. aspects of them uh, from different people. Uh, Master Natasha Man Manavaki from Greece uh, asked about uh, patterns. Uh, do we have any info about pattern designs, for example, pioneers who contributed and how much? Because now we hear after General Cho's uh, death that mostly they were designed by some pioneers. Uh, but uh, do we know which one and which ones and uh, was the contribution huge or not as much? Okay, excellent question. And uh, you want the answer right here? Right here. So uh, th this is a great resource if you're into um, Korean Taekwondo his uh, in Korean history, because, you know, uh, General Choi was quoted as saying, and I don't have the exact quote, but it's, it's pretty close to it. Never again in history can a foreign occupying force ever eradicate the history of Korea because through his patterns, it's been disseminated all around the world. You ladies and gentlemen are the carriers of this knowledge because you're doing Chunji Dong and Dosa. When I go to Korea or I talk to Koreans that emigrated to America all around the world because I travel extensively, they're amazed to know an old man like me still plays Taekwondo. And I tell them, I don't play Taekwondo. Taekwondo is Mudo. Mudo. At martial art. They don't understand that concept because in Korea, largely, it has become a, a sport and, and very much a kiddie activity. And it's a losing some popularity with the young people. So that's why I think you see a lot of things with the music and dancing and, th and, and whatnot taking place. But when I say to them, you know Pumse? They, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I say, I do the original Pumse. What, original? What, what do you mean? And I say, I do Chunji Dangun Do San Wanyo. You have to see them light up. They say, this big mouth from New York City, this obnoxious metropolitan city from this big, rich, powerful country, he knows Dangun and Do San. <laughs> so we were on a tow tour where we climbed to the top of the mountain where there's an altar that Dangun has. And we, we started doing Dangun there. There were people there celebrating uh, Dangun's memory. And they asked us to participate in the ceremony, but it was like the parting of the sea when I said, Chariot, Dangun Tol, Trumpi, Koryapshi, see, Shaka, and they started, and everybody just moved out of the way. And Mr. Anzo said to me, But there's no room. I said, Don't worry, when you start, to make room. And they did. So the patterns came from one place and one place only here, the brain, but not of me. Of Che Hung Hee. Uh, I think that when I started to assign the names of people who were instrumental in assisting General Choi at various points in time was misconstrued by a lot of people. And I think some people took that and used it as a way to promote uh, certain individuals. Uh, for their contributions. And uh, listen, I want to promote every single person for their contributions, but uh, I want to make it clear, General Choi created the patterns, all 26 of them. How do we know this? Well, you know, I have an academic PhD, I have a master's degree, I have six college degrees, I'm very much an, uh, an academic, I love learning. I was also 24 years a New York State trooper with 19 or 19, almost 20 years on the streets of New York, including work in organized crime, undercover, an assumed identity, the whole nine yards. So uh, when you dig for information, you have to vet it. You have to make sure that the information is reliable. I have no problem if John says, so-and-so told me this. That's fine. But John cannot say that this is factual. So John can say, so-and-so told me X, Y, Z. They cannot now turn around. John cannot say X, Y, Z is historically accurate. That has to be vetted. So to a person, to a person, every single pioneer that I interviewed, 
about how the patterns were created, all said, General Choi had them written down. He knew who they were named after before he started. He knew the pattern diagram. He knew how he wanted the, the movements to go in the particular case of Gaybeck. Was the motivation being in this area where Gaybeck was from? But what is clear, the name was predetermined. The movements were made to fit in that vertical line to show his strict military discipline. We know Colonel Nam Tae Hee, uh, that General Trey's pro, uh, pro, self proclaimed right hand man, his first right hand man. Uh, General Trey had Nam Tae Hee, right hand man. Then he had Kim Bak Man, right hand man. Then he had JC Kim, Kim uh, right hand man. Then he had Park Jung Tae, right hand man. General Trey always, always had a talent. Uh, the capacity, the ability to, to note who has gifts and how can I bring them ab aboard my ship here to move us forward. So these people that he picked, he only called Nam Tae his right-hand man, but they were all right-hand men at all particular periods of time. Uh, Kim Bak Man in particular was a master sergeant, which is a really high non-commissioned rank. You don't get to be a master sergeant unless you know your stuff. And you don't get to have the founder of Taekwondo, this general in the army, an ambassador, summon you to come to Malaysia with the lieutenant, Wu Jae Lim, in the spring of 1963, if you don't know your stuff. So uh, Grandma Kim himself has told me, you know, they lived in the, the ambassador's official residence. And they had a room there that they shared. And on the room, they would put up little signs, you know, A, B, C, D, you know, the pattern diagram. And they would work out what General Choi had in these movements. And every single person to a man said that General Choi solicited feedback. How does this fit? How does it flow? Does this feel all right? Does it work? Should we do something different? And in one particular case, and I don't know how many here do Chung Mu to. Chung Mu has a flying sidekick and you're in a right L stance, knife hand guarding block. You step with your right foot, you launch from your right foot, and you kick with your right foot. That is not natural. I think most people by default will go right, left, launch right, turn and kick with the right leg in the air. So who was one of the main people that uh, not, uh, General Trey uh, used to uh, finalize Chung Mu? Han Chak Kyo. Now, you know what Han Chak Kyo said? He said, General Choi, no. You step right, then step left, then kick right. General Choi said, no, step right, jump right, kick right. No, no, no. So, if you know the 30 movements in Chung Mu, who prevailed? Han Chak Kyo or General Choi? Whose idea was this? Han Chak Kyo or General Choi? It, this, it's ludicrous to, to, to think that anybody but General Choi created the patterns. But I think one of the things that Grandmaster Kim Bakman did that is unique is because of his relationship with General Choi, because they actually lived together and they were, they were you know, General Choi hated being an ambassador. He got in all kinds of trouble because he's using embassy staff. The embassy was the, basically the first Taekwondo dojang outside of, of Korea. Uh, so he got in all kinds of trouble. And uh, Grandmaster Kim told me something that makes a lot of sense. I don't know if my English, if I, symmetrical, right? Uh, both sides of the patterns are even. But if you look at the early patterns, pre Kim Bakman, what do you have? Warang, Chungmu, Uji, Unam, uh, Samil, and the Gebek. They're not symmetrical. Tangil is not either. And Tang Il was also uh, not part of that group. But look at how all of these other patterns. And that was something that uh, Grandma Sa Kim battled General Choi. And he, uh, uh, we know what the finished product was. But to say that anybody else created the patterns just not, is not in line with what any pioneer has told me directly or has been uh, like Grandmaster Earl Weiss, my senior and colleague, a really great guy, 
uh, in Chicago, he interviewed uh, Colonel Nam about this very thing. And Colonel Nam, who is the one that everybody says, the detractors of General Trey said, oh, Nam Tahir was the martial artist, General Trey wasn't. Well, any of us, and there's a lot of people here trained directly under General Trey, with General Trey, all over the world with him in his house. General Trey was a martial artist to the core. So anybody that makes that claim is just, I, I, I don't know why they would make that claim. They never met the person, they never studied under them, but they make this claim. So uh, anybody knew General Trey, he was definitely a martial artist. So the main one that they all say was the real guy behind the scenes, he said, he said, General Trey called me up. Okay, so, so this is how it goes, right? General Trey assembles them in the 29th Infantry Division, right? The 5th Division, the Odaquan. He says, move the furniture. So they move the tables, chairs out of the way. General Trey takes out his manuscript, He's sitting on a chair, and he calls Nam up. Nam! And Nam salutes. General Trey takes his manuscript, and he starts giving him the commands, one by one, for those 29 movements. That's how Warang was born. Then, come here, Nam. Sit next to me. Then they call up Han Cha Kyo, the non-commissioned officer. He hands his manuscript to Nam. Nam reads the directions to the sergeant. Why? A general doesn't communicate with the sergeants. The general has uh, junior commission officers that, commi that communicate with the non-commissioned officers who, who communicate with the enlisted men. So Nam Tehi himself is saying, I didn't devise the patterns, General Choi did. So, for uh, it's a really great question, and uh, I hope I really went at it. There's probably some other tidbits uh, of information that all support that, but to a person, every single pioneer said the same thing, up to and including uh, Grandmaster Cho Sang Ming, Park Chung Tae's teacher at the ITF instructors course, said the same thing because he was the one that was helping out with the final four patterns that people think were not done in Malaysia or completed in time. They were all done around this time. Do you, does anybody know why there was only 20 patterns in the 1965 book? One reason. They ran out of time in putting the, 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 the uh, layout of the foot diagrams and the typesetting because they needed the book to distribute when they went on the Goodwill tour around the world. So that's why there was 20 patterns in there. So it, the, all these things about who did what and where is, is nonsensical from my point of view as somebody who has dug so deep into these things. And again, John asked Pioneer X, and Pioneer X says one, two, three, A, B, C. Now I have to then take that information and verify it. I have to vet it. But there are too many Johns that are afraid when they ask a pioneer to challenge them. I'm going to end by this. In my career, I, I was never a polygraph examiner, a lie detector test, but I supervised the ones that did it. In New York City, we have a police department that had like 40,000 cops. And it was only about 4,000 state troopers. So we, we really are the elite. And uh, New York, NYPD did not have their own polygraph examiners because it's very expensive. So they would use ours. And I supervised them. And every polygraph examiner will tell you, I cannot do a test on somebody if I haven't done my homework. So they need the background investigator to give them the info, the data that they have to absorb and that they press the person on. You cannot do an interview of somebody if you don't press them on things, if you don't push back on things. And unfortunately, when we have this kind of martial art relationship, they go in and they ask and then they write down and they say, oh, so now they think they found the holy grail. No. You didn't vet it. There was no pushback at all. Grandmaster Riki had two teachers. One was Kim Bakman. And I, and I remember uh, Grandmaster Ri said that to one of uh, Grandmaster Kim's uh, uh, top students when we attended a seminar together. And uh, the other one was uh, Lee byung Mu. Lee byung Mu, really one of the uh, most senior pioneers. 
And I attended an opening ceremony at a, a student of his opened the dojang. So I attended and I knew Grandmaster Lee through my teacher. So I said to him, oh, how, I haven't seen you so long. And he didn't know who I was, he didn't remember. And I told him I'm a student of so-and-so. He goes, oh, because they're very close friends. And I, I said, yeah, I was the state trooper. He goes, so right away he knew who I was because my teacher always bragged about his student that was with the state police. So uh, I started talking to him about the history of Taekwondo. After it, it ended, it, the dinner ended and the, the festivities uh, was over, his son came up to me and said, excuse me, what did you say to my father? And I, I was a little taken aback. I said, oh, geez, you know, uh, what did I do? I hope I didn't, wasn't inappropriate. Or, you know, I try to be very courteous and very prim and proper. I said, oh, my God, what did I do? And I said, oh, I don't know. Why? He goes, I have never heard my father talk about those things in years and never talk about them outside the family. Now, why did he share them with me? Why? I don't know. I never asked him. I can only assume because he knew I did my homework, I had a great amount of interest. And since I did my homework and I had knowledge, he was eager to give me more. And I'll never forget his sharing with me. Some, and I, some of the things he asked me not to repeat, and I won't. But now when I know that, I understand some of the things that happened in Malaysia and Singapore that were of a controversial nature because I got more of the puzzle. But uh, this is a problem that we have when people ask questions and they don't push back. So very good question. And I hope that I really went into uh, giving you a lot of information to address it. Thank you. For those that may have missed it, we have the author of this book endorsed by Grandmaster George Vitale, Stuart Dansler with us. So also I can endorse it. A very good book. So if anybody wants it, it's still available on the market. And fantastic thing, fantastic read. Okay, Greg, over to you again. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Darek Nowicki. Um, we see connection in name development, but is there any connection between modern Olympic Taekwondo and Taekyon? Uh, the short answer is no. There's no connection. Uh, the Taekwondo people say there's no connection. The Taekwondo people say there's no connection. Uh, the only thing I can say about Taekyon is the name. The name, uh, yes, phonetically, right? But why is the name important? You have to think about this. Why is the name important? And the answer is very simple, ladies and gentlemen. It is very simple. The name is important because it is the only name of any martial type of activity that is wholly indigenous. Now, what does that mean? I have no idea where Taekyung came from, but the name itself only appears using Korean Hangul characters. There is no underlying Chinese Hanja characters. So since it is created by Koreans, it is held in high regard as purely indigenous. That has nothing to do with technical or physical side. If you know this piece of information, which again is very important, if you know this piece of information, you now can understand why General Choi wanted the president of Korea, the first president, Dr. Ri, to sign the calligraphy using Chinese characters. Do you see the connection now? Have you put the pieces together? Is your brain working? There are no Chinese characters for Taekyan. So if General Choi is going to get President Ri to sign the calligraphy for Taekwondo, he must use Chinese characters. So he told the president, sir, your hand is so gifted because Chinese characters are very intricate. I look at Chinese calligraphy. I, I put the scrolls up uh, early on. They were all done by General Choi, exception of one, the one in Taekwondo written in Chinese that was written by Sigmund Ray. I put them up and I look at calligraphy. I said, wow, that is a beautiful. I have no idea what it says. No idea at all. But it's beautiful. 
And that's why General Choi said to the president, please, sir, and compare Taekwondo in Korean and Taekwondo in Chinese. You will see the difference. He said, you have such a fine hand. Your artistic gift is wonderful. Please use a Chinese characters. And the president said, Taekyan, what are they? So he says, well, here's what we have. It's a Taekwondo. So see, this is the detail you need to understand why these things are important. And uh, Lee Chung Wu, Grandmaster, great. I interviewed him, the, the, the most important person on the WTF side as far as martial art goes. In a recorded interview in 2002, April, right before General Choi passed away, right when General Choi was supposed to return to South Korea, because things were very different then with the political climate, with the, the left of center administration, who won a Nobel Peace Prize for his outreach to North Korea. General Choi was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by the Canadian government. So they don't think he's a communist traitor that committed treason. In fact, the South Korean a capital is Seoul. In the, the capital city of Seoul are the embassies from all around the world. The Canadian embassy is located in Seoul. And in this embassy, there's an employee workout room, a gymnasium. It's called the Che Hong Hee Hall. Why? He is a beloved adopted citizen of Canada, held in high regard. So uh, Lee Chung Wu said in this interview, General Choi lied. He lied about the calligraphy that Sigmund Rhee did. Because if he had it, he would produce it. He doesn't have it. He lied. Well, Dr. Kim Hee Young, right? Uh, one of my mentors, uh, he helped me with my PhD. Uh, he, he wrote this. This is 900, 900 pages of raw data. Raw data about Taekwondo's history. It's a must for anybody that is interested in, in diving into these issues. So Dr. Kim asked General Choi, sir, where is this calligraphy? And he said, hey, Hyun, I only told my wife. I can't pack up everything I need and leave. I packed up a briefcase, a suitcase of essentials to go on a week's journey of teaching Taekwondo classes or seminars, whatever he was doing on, on his uh, 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 trip outside of Korea. He didn't tell anybody he's not coming back. So where is, where is this calligraphy? I don't know. It was in the, uh, the office when I left. I have no idea what happened to it. The ITF office is gone. His home is gone. I don't even know if, it's, if the building that is his home exists anymore. It might have been knocked down for, uh, you know, bigger buildings or something. But it's all gone. But he said, in the 1959 book, I have the story about the ch chief of staff and the Rock Army chief of staff of how this was all done with a copy of the calligraphy. So I, of course, uh, uh, b because of my work, um, Somebody brought to my attention a 1959 book, and I made sure it was preserved. And I brokered that deal. But this guy is a WTF guy, Nathan Doggett, who I credit when I put, when I put the 59 book online. Uh, I credit him. You know, this is a, such a valuable piece. So on my iPad, and I could bring it up and show you, but on my iPad, I carry uh, that calligraphy. And I've gotten them made up now. I have a whole bunch of them I hand out to politicians when I go to South Korea. And it, it become very, very popular. So I'm getting a private tour of the Taekwondo Wan Museum by the curator. She's a young lady, nothing to do with Taekwondo. She has a master's degree in history, and she's in charge of the museum there. And she's given me a guided personal tour uh, with Grandmaster Monia Gwari, and I think it was Grandmaster Jung Woo Jin was with us. Dr. Kim was there, but he already had seen the museum, so he didn't come on the tour with us. So we get to the calligraphy from uh, March 21st, 1971. Uh, of uh, Kim, uh, Kim Won Young got from the uh, Park Chung Hee, General Park, that said Kuki Taekwondo. So we get to that and she goes, oh, that's the original. I said, oh, no, it's not. She goes, no, no, yes, yes, that's the original. I said, no, ma'am, it's not. She goes, of course, yes, yeah, original. I said, no, ma'am, it's not. That one from March 1971. Yeah, I know, I'm museum curator, it's original. I said, no, it's not. And I took out my iPad and I showed her the original. I said, this one from 1955, you see the signature, Unam. That's a Dr. Sigmund Rhee, first president of Korea. That's the original Taekwondo. Oh my, 
I never see before. I said, no, no, you have it. She goes, no, no, I never see before. I know why. I said, no, 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 you have it. And I took her by the hand, you know, very dramatically, right? Just pushing New Yorker. I take her by the hand and we go back to where the sealed glass case has General Trey's 1959 book in there on display. I say, it's in there. I said, it's on page six. I was just pulling her leg. I don't know. It was in the beginning somewhere. It wasn't really page six, but it was really right up front. I said, it's in there. So she grabbed her radio, walkie, talkie, talkie, walkie, whatever you call it. And she's calling to the staff in Korean for them to come to bring to the key. I said, no, 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 no. It's in there. Trust me. You can check it anytime. That's where this image came from. So General Choi was brilliant. And that's why you have to understand why he asked the president to write it in Chinese. Because people guess, and it's a really good guess. I, I agree with this assessment. If he wrote it in Korean, he would have written Tekyan. But General Choi convinced him to write it in Chinese. So that's why Tekyan is important. But uh, research has been done on this very topic. And on both sides, Taekwondo people and Tekyan people say there was no collaboration. So technical wise, nothing. The name, because it's wholly indigenous, is very important to Korean people. It is so important South Korea has made, has gotten the UN to officially designate it as a cultural asset. So uh, again, a very long answer, but I hope that the information I gave you is substantial so you'll get enough of these details to start the understanding to fall into place. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, we had a question from Mr. Stewart Anslow uh, connected with uh, what you've just said. Uh, so the original question was, and I will um, read the later part of it as well. Uh, why did General Cho use Hanja and not Hangu to draw the figures of Taekwondo? Was it simply because of his calligraphy skills, perhaps? And if so, was the Taoism part mentioned, not just a great find later? As it seems more likely, he added Do based on Karate Do he studied as that was almost standard at the time. Okay, so here's where I might need a little help with this. The character for Dao comes from Chinese. I don't know the Japanese kanja for Do, how they use it, and I know how they apply it. But I don't, both Japan and Korea use hanja as underlying means to give uh, further meaning to things. So I don't, I cannot comment on how karate used it. The Tao is plain to see, written always by General Choi in Korean as Tao. Uh, what, what, what is different is how the two arts have applied it. So General Choi is not saying we're studying Taoism, but he's extrapolating from Taoism the moral character requirement for his art. Why? He wanted to produce sound physical students that were strong enough to stand on the side of justice at all time. But he wanted to put inside of them the character requirement to be honorable and to use it for just causes, mm -hmm. self-defense right so that is when it goes back to what does taekwondo mean according to general Choi, it means to have this physical way of protecting yourself uh and the guidance to use that in a way that benefits society what is the final stanza the last line in the student oath that we say at the uh, uh, beginning or end of our training sessions i shall build a more peaceful world that's why the instructor shoulder flashes has the blue on it. Blue is the recognized color of peace and calm. Uh, psychologists uh, suggest uh, making the walls a uh, pale blue in prisons and in uh, psychologists' offices and things for the, the calming effect. So everything General Trade did, he did with great thought. He really uh, went... Uh, uh, was a, a, a really deep thinker. So I can't compare it to the dough of how uh, karate used it. There's no question karate dough and now he has the taekwondo. 
There's no question about that. Uh, but the way that he looks at the dough is very simple from his literature. It's the moral culture, the moral guidance, the moral character development. That's why he uses a junior black belt at a specific age of 13 that is exactly half white and half black. Why? Because he understands a junior lacks the capacity to have the moral character of the maturity level. So they are still developing that. But the physical side is fine. The, uh, most, most young people I know, I mean, everybody who trains Taekwondo is better than me physically, but you know you have some of these young people that are just so flexible and gifted. You know, they jump up in the air and they're up there for, you know, the TV show's over. So uh, th that's how I would, I, I would uh, answer that question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, um, a user, uh, user named uh, Ron uh, answered uh, on chat that uh, the person can respond to uh, the question as this is uh, this person's field of, field of study. So if you could please uh, unmute yourself and maybe elaborate on that uh, question. Hello, uh, hello I'm Ron. Uh, I'm a uh, oh, yes. Dr. Vitalis. Um, yes, the, the Do or Dao is the same character. Do is the Korean transliteration of the Chinese character Dao. Um, and it's the same character used in Japanese. So the, the character is the same and it refers to uh, moral cultivation, not necessarily Taoism, but yes, it includes Taoist concepts, but also Buddhist concepts and Neo-Confucian concepts. Um, so uh, the, the way it's written in Korean uh, with Do and the way it's written in Chinese uh, uh, in Hansha characters is um, used in Japan and Chinese and China and uh, Korea. Um, I think uh, what all of you know the, the five major maxims or characteristics of schools, not retreat in battle and persevere and all of that. Those are Neo-Confucian concepts that have a long history of application in uh, East Asian political philosophy and martial philosophy. So um, that's actually the area of my research is what is the what are we practicing? What is happening when we practice as individuals? What becomes um, internalized in each of us that is different from what we learn physically to apply in our own um, individual context? So anyways, the, characters, the character is the same. And as Dr. Vitali points out, the interpretation of it is not only different uh, among Jap uh, Japanese karate and Korean taekwondo and Chinese martial arts, but I imagine the, the application of what Do means is different even among instructors, individual instructors, and their schools. That's an er a very interesting and wide area of interest uh, and research. But I think the key aspect of that is the Do aspect of martial arts is much older than uh, the time frame that Dr. Vitali is talking about uh, concerning the beginning of Taekwondo, which is in the 40s and 50s and, and, and 60s. The Do concepts goes way back to the time of Confucius and Mencius. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so the next question uh, from a couple of people. Um, so for example, in karate, uh, when uh, practitioners bow, they say os, and in taekwondo, we say taekwon. And do you know why? It, it is so. So why do we use Taekwon uh, when we bow? Yes. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Ron uh, is a PhD. He's one of the leading authorities in that area. That is his specialty. I'm honored that he's uh, participating in this uh, Zoom session. Uh, uh, I know him uh, quite well. Uh, there's, there's nobody that has done the kind of work that he has done. Uh, he's now in a, in a university in Baltimore, and it's long overdue that we, we don't uh, meet up again. So that's one of the things on my calendar once this whole uh, 
uh, Corona thing, you know, ends. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, us. I don't know why uh, karate does that, but uh, there's a, a very, very simple reason why we do. When when we in the ITF bow, we say Taekwondo. It goes back to our roots in the military. And when I when I do lectures in person, uh, we dispense with bowing. We salute. I have all the students salute because. History of Taekwondo begins in the Korean military. So I, I try to set the, the, the tone or the stage by going back in the military time. So when these soldiers were training, uh, you obviously had instructors that were a certain military rank, and they were training students who might have been a higher military rank. But it didn't matter. General Trey says, when you come for training, military rank's out the door, and now it's martial art rank. Uh, so that had to be understood because obviously the instructor, the teacher's in charge. And, and that's very similar to the state police. When we would go to the range, you know, there'd be commission officers, lieutenant captains that I would shoot along with. And there's just a trooper, the, the basic line officer. He's the rain, range officer. And what he says at the range goes. He is God at the range. So it doesn't matter any of that rank. So uh, when the name Taekwondo was re, uh, conceived, it was never used before. The take character was very rare. So one of the ways that General Choi, again, always thinking, detail, detail, detail. One of the ways he cemented the name of this new term that he's going to apply to his martial art was he ordered the soldiers under his command. When you salute, you say Taekwondo. That tradition has transferred over. So now when we bow, and remember in the ITF, we don't bow the way Koreans bow or the way Asians bow in the Orient or in Asian countries that have the custom of bowing. Bowing in Korea is very different from the way we bow in the ITF. I would even wager that some Koreans might take offense at how we bow because it's not the cultural norm. For instance, I, when I bow to my senior, I have to bow lower and I have to bow first and I don't come up until they come up. I don't offer my hand. I wait for them to offer my hand to shake. There, there are these uh, cultural norms, which is the same in the military, right? I salute my uh, captain. I don't, return, I don't return my hand until the captain brings down their hand. So this is the, the Korean army was established by the U.S. Army. This New York State Police uses U.S. Army military protocol, so I'm quite familiar with it. And uh, the Korean Army used Korean, uh, the Korean Army used U.S. Army, uh, was the one that set it up, and of course they follow those, those protocols. So uh, the saluting was done, and now it, it transferred over to the bow. And in ITF, we only bow 15 degrees, and both people bow 15 degrees equally. This is very un, uh, uh, unlike the uh, custom. The same thing, you don't come up until the senior comes up, but the bowing is very different. And the bowing in ITF Taekwondo, I like to say is kind of like a mix between Korean culture and military protocol. And I think that makes a lot of sense because who the heck was General Choi? A general in the Korean army. A Korean male that was a general in the Korean army. So I think it makes sense. But specifically, uh, starting in 1955, he directed his troops to shout out Taekwon when they, when they saluted each other in the military. And that has uh, uh, transferred over. I think it's a wonderful tradition. I teach my students and we have great we have great uh, fun with that because when we bow, uh, uh, I'll, I'll sometimes stay down and I say, oh, I'm stuck and I'll have them come to push me up. And when they come push me up, I say, don't stand up. You got to stay bowed down. So we have a lot of fun with that. I think it's a wonderful tradition. And that was an easy question. Good. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. So we have another question uh, about the um, cooperation. So from uh, Jakub Demut, 
so some people say that cooperation is needed to keep uh, Taekwondo at, Olymp at the Olympics and the unity will benefit uh, everybody involved. And do you think that the third group from the list that you uh, mentioned that contribute to uh, Taekwondo as being divided uh, should be also involved? So if yes, uh, Jakub suggests why not gather all the WTF and ITF headquarters and uh, also all other existing Taekwondo or Taekwondo-like organizations in the world. Uh, do you think it is possible? Yes. Okay, so uh, this is a, uh, a good question. This is a question uh, not for the historian, because this is a question going forward, but as somebody that has delved deeply into the history, uh, I certainly can use guidance from what we've learned from the past in, in, in uh, advising us how to move forward. So we know unity with unity, their strength. Uh, we know that in terms of the Olympics, we know karate is knocking on the door. They will be, I was going to say 2020 Olympics, you know, that's pushed till next year. But karate will, will debut as a demonstration sport. Will it? Will it um, be successful in becoming a sport that they will see again? I have no idea. We also get a lot of uh, competition from Chinese wushu, you know, knocking on that door to come in. But I, I try to tell Taekwondo people because one of the things I do is, is because I network with everybody and I work with everybody and I, and I, don't, I don't say, oh, you know, elevate anybody else or group over one, another. Uh, I have been able to participate in very high level negotiations uh, with the WTF. Uh, uh, even the Kukiwan has reached out to me, uh, the Taekwondo Wan, uh, uh, you know. So I have been very involved in the latest work in, in bringing people together. So the WTF and Taekwondo in particular is not only facing pressure from karate and wushu. They are facing pressure from every other sport that's not in the Olympic program. If anybody remembers several years back, not that long ago, several years back, wrestling, the oldest Olympic sport, was removed from the program. It was through uh, Iran, Russia, uh, P Putin uh, in particular, and uh, the United States, uh, uh, very influential in putting a lot of pressure that a special deal was made to save wrestling. So what everybody has to understand, Taekwondo or otherwise, I don't remember the exact number of official sports there are in the Summer Olympic program. It's somewhere in the 20s. Uh, but it's somewhere in the 90s of sports out there that is recognized by the Olympic movement. They're, they're recognized by uh, Sport Accord, uh, General Association of International Sp uh, Sports Federations, right? So we know there are 90 plus sports and we know there's only slots for 20 something. What this current IOC president, and I've met him, uh, Professor Chang Lung was very close with him. Uh, uh, they were uh, colleagues. Uh, Professor Chang worked very hard to get him elected as IOC president. And just like Dr. Kim Moon Young, I call him the miracle man of Olympic Taekwondo, the father of Olympic Taekwondo. This man pulled off a miracle. How did he do it? Uh, there are a lot of ways that he did it. But uh, he was a very powerful man in the international sports committee, uh, sp sports community. And he was also uh, uh, obviously, he made it to vice president of IOC. Uh, he could have been IOC president, except for all the scandals and whatnot that happened towards the end. But uh, the IOC is all operates on these kind of relationships. And uh, prior, when wrestling was got knocked out, people were shocked. And you know the two sports that they thought were going to get knocked out? 
to pentathlon and taekwondo. Those were the ones that were the leading contenders to be unseated. They were shocked when it was wrestling. And the uh, pentathlon was saved, they say, because the president or vice president, I forget, is the Juan Samaranch's son. So relationships and connections are very, very vital. So uh, the takeaway from this, the lesson to be learned is no sport is safe in the Taekwondo, in the Olympic movement going forward. No sport. Taekwondo can be protected, can be protected by the fact that it's only one of two Asian sports. But obviously, if you take out Taekwondo and replace it with Japanese karate or Chinese wushu, no problem. Or if you take out Taekwondo and replace it with an Asian uh, stand-up striking art combat thing, you, 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 know, you don't have that uh, problem that you lost an Asian sport. But what's clear is no sport is guaranteed. And what this IOC president has done, and if you look at their 2020 agenda and beyond, they are no longer concerned with the amount of sports that are in the program. They are a, a concerned with the cap of the athletes. They can physically house, I think the number is 12,500 athletes in the Olympic Village with the security, the funding and stuff, transportation, meals, you name it. Uh, that is the level that they are comfortable with. So uh, it does not matter to them with the cap at 12,500 if the 12,500 comes from 25 sports or 35 sports or 40 sports. What matters to them is one thing and one thing only, advertising revenue. So they need to get in sports that are going to make people like you and me tune in. Because when we tune in to watch, we also watch the commercials that they uh, sell for advertising space that advertisers pay really obscene amount of money for. So it is all about uh, the bottom line of money and, and dollar. So if we want to maintain Taekwondo being in the Olympics, we need to work together. Now, the WTF is never, ever going to be supplanted. So any ITF person or any independent person out there that actually has this notion, I would say throw some cold water on your head uh, and wake up because you have no, you have no idea of reality. Uh, I lose track. Maybe it was 2019 or maybe it was 2018. But very recently, the WT was awarded favorite, or uh, I forget what the title it was, but it was, it was awarded International Federation of the Year. The WT is loved by the IOC. Why? Peace Corps, WTF Peace Corps, humanitarian Taekwondo, uh, refugee Taekwondo, all of these very, very popular social issues that a very, very rich country like South Korea, now a member of the G20, host of the G20, right? They have so many rich corporations and private donors and government money that they put into this effort. So WTF is not going away. Nobody's going to supplant it. The WT is the International Federation for Taekwondo. Plain and simple. Plain and simple, it's not going to change. So if Taekwondo people want to go into the Olympics, it's quite all right. They can because the WT is an open organization. They are open to anyone. The problem for some ITF people is, yes, I want to compete in the Olympics, but I don't want to lose my identity. Well, we have brokered a landmark deal, groundbreaking where they recognize ITF certificates. You don't have to get a kooky one one. Uh, they recognize our, our uh, coaches, our uh, instructors, our umpires. All of this stuff has happened. It's all a done deal. Now, uh, they are open to anyone. And the, the reality is that this is only possible 
for one reason and one reason only. North Korea is a member nation of ITF. And North Korea and South Korea are divided. It's a very political issue. So therefore, politics is the driving force behind it. The IOC wants nothing more to do than put a feather in their cap showing they have, they have brought the two halves of Korea divided since 1945 together through sport. The IOC motto is peace through sport. So that is what the focus is on. So with that being said, anybody can go into the WTF umbrella. If you don't, if you are an ITF stylist and you don't want to give up your ITF uh, background, your ITF uh, banner, or, or so to speak, it's now possible through this alternate route with certification because the WT has recognized the ITF as a legitimate sister organization uh, on the international level. So that's all done. That's all done. The remaining part, and it's the hardest part, is, well, when, and these things, I can't talk about the details because it's ongoing, uh, and these negotiations are uh, confidential. But one of the main things that the WTF wants, I believe they can get, but it's a very hard sell, and it's not going to be given to them unless the ITF gets something that they really want, that's going to be a hard sell. So uh, I do think it's possible. But what I think ITF people want is reasonable in terms of the overall Olympic movement. Track and field has how many different events, right? You have the marathon, you got a 100, 100 meter dash or whatever. You know, I, you know, I don't know whether the actual names and swimming, how many events does swimming have? You know, backstroke, breaststroke, butterfly. You know, I, they have so many diving the height of the platform. They have so many events. There's no reason why Taekwondo cannot have WTF sparring, ITF sparring, WTF sparring, ITF patterns, uh, WTF patterns, ITF patterns. Uh, the, it, the possibilities are unlimited. And it's all, it's all up to, can the two parties work something uh, that is mutually beneficial to everybody in a way that will be politically uh, uh, of, of such political benefit that it will make those kind of uh, uh, give and take worthwhile and that the IOC can turn around and say, look what we did. So, you know, the very long answer is yes. The short part is we need to cooperate. The more that we cooperate, the better the outcome will be for everybody. But cooperation is, is, is sometimes difficult. You know, I said, I would say to people, you know, on one side is zero, the other side is 100. So if we're over here, the ITF, we have nothing, right? Any ITF, I don't care who signs these certificates, I don't care, you do Chunji, you're over here, you have nothing as far as the Olympic movement goes. If you're WTF, you're over here and you have 100. So on a scale of zero to 100, me, myself, and I, the three of us, along with the people I've been networking with, maybe we move our side over to 21. And all the people that didn't help us are going to say, see, look at the final product. It's nothing. And I say to them, if you helped, maybe we could have been to 25 or 33 or 41. You didn't help. All you did was bad mouth. All you did was bad mouth. So yeah, I'm not happy with the final product, but what do you want when we do it on our own? And the WTF is not stupid. When I first met Dr. Cho, the president of WT, uh, it was very early on before he even knew I was connected to the ITF. And, you know, uh, uh, you know I was this kind of person that work, walked in these circles. And I asked him about, you know, ITF and WTF. And he said, uh, straight out. Which ITF? And then he showed me he had a fax that was sent to the hotel in Jersey we were staying from his office in Korea. And the fax was a communication from uh, President Che Jung Wah, General Che's son. So, you know, he's willing and, and uh, very open to anybody. But 
if everybody runs there individually, then where we move and how much we get is limited if we don't do it with some form of unity. So, yep, uh, again, very complicated issue. And I think if we look to guidance from where we were before, it's a miracle what Dr. Kim did and the WT. It is, a, it is unprecedented in the international sport movement to gain official Olympic status in the time they did. Remember, they were recognized in 1980. They appeared as a demonstration sport in 1988. And they were approved, was it 2000? I forget, no. I forget when they were officially approved, 1994, I think. And they appeared in 2000 for the first time as official sport. Uh, even 1992, Barcelona, Spain. You can only have a demonstration sport one time. How did they have it two times? Dr. Kim, brilliant. He went to Juan Samaranch that he was very close with, and he said, oh, can we do a one-day exhibition sport? <laughs> Samaranch said, what's an exhibition sport? We only have a official sport and a demonstration sport. He goes, oh, exhibition is less medals, only one day, and well, no, 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 we can't. We, uh, it, it sounds like demonstration sport. We can only have it one time. But he said, okay, you convince enough people, I will support it. He convinced enough people. And they didn't have an exhibition sport. They had a demonstration sport. And they didn't have a one day. They had a two days. And I think it might have been the same amount of medals four years earlier in Seoul. So, you know, uh, anything is possible. You just have to sell the IOC on. It. And you're not going to sell it with a bunch of crybabies fighting over little tidbits of whatever. Uh, you want to get something of substance from the uh, IOC, you have to make it known to them why it's in their, their interest to do it. And uh, obviously, if we unite and we have a, a, a solid front, uh, that obviously can, can happen uh, with better results. But we, we, will, we will never supplant the WT. And it's ludicrous that ITF people actually say, oh, uh, we're going to knock them out. All we have to do is show them our, our, our fighting rules with so much more exciting and so much more action. People, wake up, drink some coffee, jump in the cold shower. You uh, don't know reality. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Next. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, uh, what are the significant contributions of the North Korean government to Taekwondo development, especially as regards ITF Taekwondo? Uh, okay, so um, I would say the easy answer to that or the quick answer is not much at all. I mean, think about it, historical timeline. 1955, it's introduced there September 1980. They start training there in February 1981. What are we talking about? The development's over. They've now accepted it and uh, have become great exponents of it. And what they did and, you know, uh, is uh, uh, Grandmaster Seraph, uh, you know, I was vice president of USTF, he president of the USTF. He, he's one of, uh, one of the, uh, one of the people I treasure the most in martial arts. Uh, for me as an American from New York, seeing a fellow American, a non-Asian, non-Oriental, you know, a Westerner, achieve what he did, sent a signal to me. I can do that someday. So, uh, Grandma Sasarev is of Korean War age. He told me the story of how he lost one of his best friends. There were, you know, like I have, there's two of my friends who were like the Three Stooges. My, my friend's girlfriend says, oh, the Three Stooges, the Three Musketeers, right? Depending on what's going on, we're either the Three Musketeers or the Three Stooges. So, he had his three musketeers, his three stooges, and one of them was killed in the Korean War. So he went in 1980 on the seventh ITF demonstration team to North Korea and pledged never to go back again because he felt it was very harsh uh, with the propaganda and how they portray our country, our, our people, and our government. So uh, he said to me, and, and I, have a, I have a copy of his certificate, he was a secretary general of the ITF in the early 80s. He was a fifth degree black belt. The secretary general of the ITF. Why? 
They had nobody. Everybody more or less was gone. Grandmaster Riki Ha stayed, start to finish, the only Korean loyal to General Choi from start to finish. So the ITF was broken. When they went to North Korea, that was the final nail in the coffin. Now, General Choi and his band of Taekwondo guys were not just communist sympathizers. They were traitors. They actually considered them to commit treason. Now, I don't believe any of that, but if you are a Korean and you have these feelings, if your family and your country suffered in a devastating civil war that was among the most the highest amount of death and destruction in a war of that period that ever, ever was waged on this planet. So I understand, I understand that sentiment and I will never try to talk somebody out of it. But when General Choi went there, they all left him. They were blacklisted. They were written out of history. They don't deserve that treatment, especially the ones that didn't go and the ones that walked away, but it didn't matter. The dictatorship ruined them. And it's important that we give them their good names back. So what happened was the ITF was broken. If you look at the world championships, the third one held in Argentina. And I finally got the results, thanks to Grandmaster Nesta Galarraga. Uh, hardly anybody showed up. Now, I don't mean Korean instructors. I mean... I think there was like 13 countries. How do you have a world championship with 13 countries? So we were broken. And uh, eventually the ITF moved to Vienna, Austria. We, conti we continued to spread to Eastern Europe, the communist bloc, uh, Soviet Union, Red China, all these communist socialist countries that South Korea could not go to. Uh, some of you were there, Budapest, March, April, 1988, the World Championships, sixth ITF World Championships, the biggest one so far, it was broadcast all over Europe. Later that year, the Summer Olympics was in Seoul. And you know what the South Korean government did for the first time ever as a result of those Olympics? They instituted diplomatic relationships with Hungary. We already hosted, they are hungry, already hosted a world championship. Do you know how far ahead we were? And uh, we're being hosted by Poland today. Uh, North Korea had Kyuksul instructors in Poland that were recalled and replaced by Taekwondo instructors. So what North Korea did was financially support the ITF like South Korea was doing with the WTF. What North Korea did was give General Choi Korean instructors that we could be dispatched around the world. And they were dispatched around the world to places the WTF could not go. So uh, they could not go there because they didn't have any diplomatic relations. They could not go there. And we set up Taekwondo in all those countries. It was General Choi and the ITF that spread Taekwondo around the world, the whole world including the socialist and communist countries, including the third world non-aligned countries. He spread Taekwondo around the world. He should be uh, applauded for that. And uh, he's been paid back with terrible slander. But uh, what uh, eventually we moved the ITF headquarters to Vienna, Austria, as I said, and we purchased a building of our own. It's the present location. And that was done with North Korean funds. Uh, that money was paid back through certificate bartering fees and, and whatnot. But the ITF probably would have been just, uh, just totally collapsed in the 1980s if we did not have the support of North Korea. And of course, now, uh, it's amazing if you go to WT office in, in Switzerland, in the Olympic city of Lucerne, or in Seoul, uh, you go to the Kukiwan or the Taekwondo Wan or the KTA. I mean, they have leading academic professionals at major universities that conduct all kinds of research for them. And that's one of the things that we have in uh, the government in Pyongyang, because that similar type of uh, support that 
uh, you know, said we don't get from anywhere else around the world. And one of the things that, that I'm trying to do is, is network eventually the South Korean professors and the North Korean professors. One of the things they want to uh, approach me about discussing is establishing a philosophical base for Taekwondo as, as, as well as, you know, exchange of the, of the technical types of things. And these things are long overdue, but uh, uh, there is no doubt about the kind of support that North Korea gave. It, it comes at a very high price, sadly, but again, that's the political reality. But as far as the development of it, I don't really think, uh, you know, technical wise, because General Choi set the syllabus and the syllabus is set. Uh, so from a technical standpoint, you know, uh, even the controversy of Juche, that was General Choi's creation. It wasn't theirs. And even Sine Wave. Sine Wave didn't come from North Korea. Sine Wave was back from the 60s. It was in the 60s in the ITF official training. They didn't call it Sine Wave. And in, I have it written down somewhere in Korean, what they called it in those first uh, training sessions. It wasn't called Sine Wave. It was called something that translated to rhythmic motion, right? You wanted to move your body in a rhythmic motion. So uh, I don't really think it's anything that relates on the uh, purely technical side. I think it was financial. And, you know, obviously, look at, look at today. Poland is one of the powerhouses in ITF Taekwondo. And uh, only the Polish people can answer why it's uh, uh, considered a powerhouse, but it, it is. Russia is considered a powerhouse. North Korea is. Even Ireland now, look at the advances Ireland has done. Uh, Argentina, a powerhouse, always was. So uh, in, in places, Czech Republic, where, you know, uh, Bulgaria, they have high standard and they, they still have North Korean instructors that are resident there. So, uh, you know, along in, in those terms, I think that's where, the, you know, the support could be. But uh, thank you. Good, good question. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a question about uh, Alex Gillis's book. Um, in the book, uh, General Che, quote, removed, unquote, his son, Che Junhua, from becoming the next president, accusing Che Junhua's plan to kill him. And the question is, what do you think about this? And do you have any idea why the argument started? Uh, okay, so uh, it killed who? Uh, well, the question says, accusing Che Junhua, uh, Junhua's plan to kill him. Oh, okay, okay, no. Oh, I, I would have to act, look at that actual quote. Okay, so uh, 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 I, I, don't, I don't want anything to do with delving into personal family matters. That's a, a, something that's a, a private nature. But I, I, will tell you, I will tell you what was happening. So we know uh, from the context of the times, we know that uh, President Che jung was a very, very popular. He was traveling the world. Uh, he's such a lovely man. Uh, his personality is very much like General Choi. So he he's, has this magnetic personality. His English is flawless. And uh, he presented a very good image and connected with a lot of people around the world. Very similar to the way the late, great Grandmaster Park jung tae was. Uh, we called him Park Chung Tae, the people's master. There was something special about him. So when you have a person that's the face of ITF that's traveling the world, they connect with people. And General Trey was not a, a, a dumb person at all. He thought of No Bin Jik being uh, successor as ITF president. He thought of Jun Ri being successor as ITF president. He thought of Park Chung Su being successor of ITF president. He thought about Kang Su Chung. The, the, he's still alive. The, the most senior Taekwondo proponent in the world. He thought about him being next ITF president. And he thought about his own son being next ITF president. So uh, in 2001, in 2000, uh, this topic started coming up. And General Trey said, both in writing and uh, in public, from his own mouth, uh, his son would succeed him as president of ITF. And we know what happened in Italy, where uh, there was a movement to start that transitional process. And th there's a lot of controversy. Uh, was that by the book and all these other things? It, it doesn't matter. What matters is they left there 
understanding that General Choi would be president for two years of the six year term and his son would have the final four years. So they left there with that understanding. What people need to know, and Alex Gillis's book is fascinating. It's really a great source for flushing this out because it, people have to understand General Choi never agreed to this. Uh, in my research, I've uh, interviewed many key people. This was a, uh, um, I want to be careful with how I describe it. It was an orchestrated plan, but I don't want to say orchestrated plan with any kind of nefarious uh, connotation. But you have to understand, General Choi was president of ITF. Translation is, <laughs> General Choi was the ITF, okay? He was, uh, he, whatever, he, he ran the show. Nobody ever challenged him for the presidency. If people challenged him, for, thought about challenging for the presidency or for leadership, they were banished to bogey land, okay? So the, the, uh, this is just the way it was. It's not a bad thing necessarily. It's just the way it was. Did anybody challenge Kim Un Young for presidency? Did, were there any contested elections? I mean, he ruled uh, uh, with an iron fist and he was phenomenal. Look what he did. So uh, in 2001, this happens. But what people need to understand is General Choi was caught off guard by that. But since the plan was so well uh, organized that it was able to go through. And uh, now it goes through, and now General Choi starts thinking, how do I undo this? And that's when the meeting comes up in January of 2002 in Vienna, Austria. And th does that meeting, was it by the book? Uh, was it constitutional? These are all questions that you can argue, argue either side. I say it doesn't matter because what happened? His son was the sitting secretary general of the ITF. He was not allowed in the meeting. Uh, people that supported him were official registered ITF NGB delegates were not allowed into the meeting. So did the meeting have the proper quorum? Did it have the uh, uh, amount of time required for a notice? Was it done the right way? All that stuff, please, it's ridiculous. They don't let the secretary general of the ITF in. They don't let official delegates in. That tells you about that meeting. Now. What happens after the meeting? There was not a legal recourse to battle what was clearly not legitimate. There was a declaration, we are creating our own ITF. They resigned from ITF, they established a new ITF. So that means there's two ITFs. And then of course, General Trey dies and the ITF splits again. So uh, it's clear to me, General Trey wanted his son to succeed him. He said it. We don't need to make it up. He said it. He's on record saying it. We know what happened in Italy. We know what happened afterwards. Now, here's why what happened afterwards. Again, you cannot understand unless you understand the context of the political times. General Choi died June 15, 2002. On June 15, 2000, two years exactly to the day before, Kim Dae-jung, Kim Jong-il meet for the first time, the two leaders of Korea meet face to face in this historic summit. When their summit ended, and again, if you go to Korean media, you will see there were eight points, eight points of cooperation that the two unification ministries of Pyongyang and Seoul, of the two Koreas, were going to work on. One of those eight points, bullet points, was the integration of Taekwondo and exchange of demonstration teams. So General Choi is saying, oh my God, I finally am gonna sit at the table with my arch enemy, my nemesis, the pain in my neck, the thorn in my side, Kim Un Young. They were supposed to meet in Pyongyang and Seoul and start this process. And what happens? General Choi now is going to be replaced. So he says, oh, my God, with this br breakthrough, I need to maintain. This is what he used as his reasoning. Remember, he never conceded to this two-year, four-year transition. But now he had a 
a foolproof, airtight excuse to undo the election. So they then, whether they undid it or not is a moot point because uh, those people resigned from the ITF. They weren't expelled. They resigned from the ITF. Uh, it's all in writing. I have these doc documents. So now they go their own separate way. So a lot of this uh, uh, happened was very unfortunate. The timing was, was terrible to say the least. And uh, people have to understand the real reasons behind is politics of North and South Korea. The final pattern in General Trey's syllabus, Tong Il, unification. He worked his whole life, his whole life to reunify his country at great loss personally. And of course, family-wise too, as we can see. But this was his, this was his quest. This was his goal. He used Taekwondo, he used ITF, he used anything to accomplish this. And uh, I'm glad to see that today in South Korea, he's being recognized for those efforts. But unfortunately for ITF, it caused a lot of problems. And sadly, tragically for his family. But, you know, uh, uh, being with the, the Che family and being honored, they, they uh, gave me the Choi family star. I was just moved to tears. Uh, uh, getting to know uh, his widow and uh, his son and his daughters and his granddaughter, you know, uh, uh, they're such a wonderful family that has given up a lot. Uh, uh, Grandmaster Jung Wu Jin from Tiger Little Times, he interviewed uh, Mrs. Che and she repeated these remarks at the 100 year celebration of General Che's birth. She said, when I meet my husband in the afterlife, I need to apologize to him because I never knew the global impact he had with Taekwondo. She said, I have to apologize because if I could go back in time, I would do things differently to support him even more. So, you know, uh, from a family standpoint, you know, I wanted my father to come watch me play ball, baseball, right, American pastime. And, uh, you know, he worked hard. He wasn't there all the time and whatnot. But think about it. General Choi, all around the world. He would say, I have two homes, one in Canada, one in the airplane. I mean, the man just was crazy with Taekwondo. So that is definitely uh, a, a, an unfortunate chapter. Uh, it, it is the reality. And I'm, I'm just happy now that uh, the family has really uh, healed a lot. And, you know, it's an important question. And, and I hope people don't think I, I dodged it. And, and I hope that uh, my answer was, uh, uh, you know, honest and to the point. Thank you. Okay, Piotr, would you like to uh, conclude? Is there anything else? Anybody else have a question? Uh, Greg, is it is it all? Are we ready with the questions, or we just uh, finish finish here and save the the rest for the for the follow up, which is planned soon? Doesn't matter to me. I'm fine. If anybody has questions, they just want to shout them out. I don't mind at all. Whatever you guys want is fine by me. Uh, uh, can can I ask a question? Uh, okay, no problem. Maybe just uh, just is is that that's fine? Okay. Yes, okay. Yeah, no, that's no problem. We don't have a time limit, but I, I just uh, I just would like to suggest that we will finish this meeting okay. soon. And then we okay. will, uh, of okay. course, your question is okay now, no problem. Uh, and we will have another chance. We'll do a follow up uh, as we spoke with, with uh, Grandmaster Vitale. Of course, okay. everybody's invited and we'll proceed with more questions. But now it's, the microphone is yours. You can ask your question, please. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, so, Grandmaster Vitale, um, I would, I've got a question about the uh, 1965 book because mm -hmm. the Patterns are in like a uh, different order. Yes. Than, um, so like up to gay back, it is in the order Tronji up to gay back, right. and then up to gay back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you got like uh, Yusin is before Ching Jang, and then Samuel is after Oldie, and Kodang is after Samuel. Mm -hmm. So like with that, is there like um, were they? So like was like Samuel taught after? I mean Kodang taught before Samuel, sort of thing. 
um, I'm just, it, it, were they sort of taught in a different order um, back, back in like 1965 and then also got a qu another question on the book is about so, um, on page 84 it states about side thrusting kick and there isn't such thing as a side piercing kick um, and and it says a side thrusting kick and then it, on page 84 of the 1965 it states that side thrusting kick is with the foot sword and you bring the foot sword right. uh, yeah. to the inner knee which is basically what we call nowadays a, um, a side piercing kick right. but, but yeah. then it was called a a side okay. thrusting kick. Well, and allow, me to allow me to ask the second question first. Uh, early on the terminology yeah. the terminology was very much Japanese influenced. Okay. General Choi over a period of time developed more uh, uh, better terminology and he relied more on Korean terms and the underlying Chinese hanja to separate from the Japanese influence. Uh, if you notice in the, in the beginning, they were called hyung, now they're called to. So hyung is the uh, Korean way of uh, uh, taking the characters from kata into Korean. So that was uh, the, the best or prime example of that. So don't get bogged down with the terminology more focus more on the actual description of the technique because later on when he included a side uh thrust kick we we know it's a different foot position with a different tool so don't let that confuse you that is just that it just indicates taekwondo was in the developmental process uh many people will say the 1972 textbook is when when the uh original taekwondo was uh uh finalized uh, others will say, the General Trey himself will say the 15 volume encyclopedia that he wrote in 83 and was published in 85. And I'll add, it was published in 85 because it took two years to find a publisher because the KCIA wouldn't, wouldn't allow anybody to publish it because of the pressure they put on it. Grandmaster Jung Woo Jin took on the responsibility of publishing those, that first edition and it, uh, his family suffered terribly because of it. So that is the terminology part. Uh, the patterns part, yes, I learned uh, uh, Chunji de Gaybeck and the next pattern I learned, I learned as Yushin. And I learned that as a third degree. Uh, I learned the Kwangay Poon as a first degree. I learned uh, uh, Gaybeck and, and the original Koryo as a second degree, which has now been replaced by the present day Koryo. And then I learned Yushin as a third degree. And my teacher, I learned from General Choi, he only went to a seminar where General Choi went over the first 12 patterns. And then of course he had the book and whatnot. So I don't know in the 65 book, if there was much consideration to the sequential order of the patterns, how they're listed in the pattern section, because the priority was getting the book finished in English, so they had copies to distribute when they went on the Goodwill tour. So remember, that Goodwill tour was very important because it gave several countries that would, in less than a year, become the founding member nations of the ITF. So the emphasis on the book was uh, getting it printed. So I would have to then look, and I don't know this off the top of my head, and this is where you have to research this. So this is homework for you. You have to look in the 65 book and see in the training syllabus, because I know it, it handles up to first degree. I don't know if they have any uh, testing sheets or any uh, uh, syllabus for the Don levels, because that would answer more definitively when it was taught. But uh, uh, what you have to keep in mind, in 1965, when that book was published, Taekwondo was still in the developmental stages. Uh, you, you can look back and you can examine from 1962 when the Taesudo did their uh, national black belt test. Warang was used for first degree. Uh, Chungmu was used for first degree to go to second degree. So color belts did Warang. And uh, then first degree was Chungmu. Second degree was, uh, I'm not sure if it was OG or Samil. 
and uh, Samil and uh, Yuam, well, no, Yuam wasn't in there, Gabe Beck was in there. So you can see it that order, but that's how the Tesudo people did it. In Dr. Kimmy Young's book, there is the uh, training syllabus from the Otaquam, but this is very old. It goes back to the 50s uh, and, and before uh, the additional patterns appeared in print. So I don't know if there is a very clear definitive answer for what you're asking. So that's the best I can do with that. You had two really good questions and, and one, one has stumped me that I'll have to, you know, look more into it, but, but I thank you for them. Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like, uh, I would like to finish our meeting. So it doesn't mean that we'll the question, but I would like if possible to move them to the second part, because I think we, uh, we have received a lot of information from Grandmaster Vitali today. We had a lot of interesting questions as well. And uh, maybe there will be some questions that will actually come up after uh, reviewing this today's meeting. Uh, so I would like to thank you all to all the participants, uh, uh, regardless of the country you come from, regardless of your grade, I'm really honored to have you all here and especially, of course, a big thank you to, to Grandmaster Vitale. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, I hope, I think that uh, the number of people who are here today with us shows that such meetings are important, they are needed by the community. It's important to exchange knowledge to fill the holes in the history, to rebank maybe some myths, and we will all grow through this. So again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, uh, thanks, uh, thank you very much, Greg, for running the Q&A part and co-hosting this event. Uh, I will try to put the recording online that the, the meeting is recorded. If you have any questions, uh, you can email Grandmaster Vitala, because I know he doesn't use the messenger, he will tell you about this. You can also send a message to me as well, because I use messenger. You are uh, welcome to send me a friend messages on Facebook. I'm pretty active on the, on the social medium, this one particular. So I will try to help wherever possible. Uh, thank you and grandmaster vital if you want to say something yes no i i just wanted to, to to thank you again personally for hosting this i wanted to thank all the people from around the world that that tuned in um you know i i equate what i do you know like a farmer a farmer plants these seeds and they uh cultivate them and then they harvest them and imagine if i did all this kind of work and I was like a farmer that took these crops and put them in a barn and shut the barn door and put a lock on it. And then the food, because it's food, the food would rot and we'd have to throw it away. That's a sin in my religion and that is a crime. I mean, that's just terrible. So I am honored to be able to share what I've been able to, you know, uh, assemble and put in my barn, so to speak. And you know, since I was never blessed with physical talent, uh, for me to stay 40 something years, what is it going on 50 years soon or something? Or 40, 47 years? Uh, for me to stay so long in an activity like this that's so physical and to be able to contribute, I need to do it in a way that's, uh, you know, other than uh, physical. So I delved into a topic that I'm, I'm quite happy to share and I want you to know that, uh, in sharing these things, it gives me value. So uh, it's been a tough time here in New York and uh, just to be able to network and see you know, friends of mine that uh, I've had the pleasure of coming to know and love over the years uh, has been uh, a great highlight. So uh, I am available anytime to ask questions. I don't use Facebook Messenger because on my iPad, I just can't hit the thing and it just makes a big mess and I can't hold on to anything and I'm terrible with following through on communications. So do it by email, uh, do it by follow-up email. If you have a question, I get questions all the time and my response on the email is, please post the question on my Facebook page because I will answer it 
and then people can all see the benefit of the answer because I get repeated questions and I have no problem answering them. But if we do it more publicly, I think more people can benefit. We can, we can share more. Plus, I want my guesses, I want the, my research to be held up to the light. You know, I, I, want, I want the light to shine on it because I want people to know this is what I found. Am I right? Do I, did I miss something? Do you have something to add to it? Am I, am I misinterpreting something? So Taekwondo can be very political. And, you know, my father's stronger than your father. My mother's prettier than your mother or whatever, right? We all get, but when you show me I'm wrong, I'm not mad. I win. Why? Because I learned more of the truth. So I win. So I want this to be as public as possible because I want that scrutiny. I want the light to shine on it. I want it to stand up to scrutiny. I want people to say, hey, consider this. Oh, this is what I heard, right? So uh, it's vitally important. So I am available all the time to answer any questions you have. Uh, for those of you who have visited New York, uh, I'll bring you to all the best places. You don't need to look at any of those tour guides because they'll, they'll bring you to the tourist traps. I'll bring you to real New York. As, as And I know some of you here already been to my house and or been out and about with me taking you to places that are gems that we as New Yorkers know are gems, but you would have never known about them because you're from halfway around the world and you've got some tourist book that's going to lead you to, you know, the restaurant that pays for that <laughs> advert or something. So it really would be my pleasure. Uh, Taekwondo, my religion, my family, my academic education has made me who I am today. And uh, I don't know where I'd be without Taekwondo and you guys. So please feel free to reach out to me anytime, anytime about any subject matter. The most I can say is, I'm sorry, I don't know. And maybe we can work on finding the answer together. And I'm just going to end with saying, I am working on a project. We have all the results for the ITF World Championships except 1978 Oklahoma. So we're going to start somehow uh, posting uh, what little results we have. And every single person has to spread the word. Do you know anybody that was in Oklahoma in 1978? Do you know anybody that won? Do you have archives from your uh, NGB or your association who went? We can ask. We need to compile the remaining missing results from the second ITF World Championships. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing not to have this. So I know if we don't do it now, it's going to be so much more difficult to do 20 years down the line. So uh, I've been working with some great people over the years. Now I got uh, two more partners, one from Argentina, one from New Zealand, that's really gung-ho about doing this. So we need to move that project forward. I need your help. Don't say no. Pay back by paying forward. Do this. Reach out. Somebody knows these answers. Somebody has clippings. And I went through every magazine I could find, nothing. You guys have it. I know somebody has it. We have to find it. We have to be persistent. So thank you again. It was really my sincere honor. Uh, I'm touched by the response. And I remain open at all time to, to help you in any way I can. God bless you all and be safe. Thank you. To finish also positively, Grandmaster Vitale, I probably know something who can have at least partial results from 1978 from Oklahoma. So Excellent. I will reach out to this person and at least a part of the results is there for sure. That's okay. right. See, it's and good to have a big mouth. Open <laughs> your mouth, get the word out. <laughs> okay, and also to the people who send their uh, questions in the very last part of this meeting, all the questions were written down and saved for part two. So if you come for part two, the, the questions will be on the top of the list and there will be first in a queue to answer by to answer by Grandmaster Vitala. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Have a good day, night, whatever. Just enjoy the next day. Enjoy life. Thank you for being here with us. And goodbye. Thank you, Master Vitali. Thank you. Thank you. Someday I'll goodbye. run into you in New York.
Okay. I thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Grandmaster. Well. Thank, thank you, Grandmaster Dr. Thank you, Grandmaster Vitali. Thank, 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 thank you, Grandmaster. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Grandmaster Vitali. Thank you, Piot. Thank you, Grandmaster Vitali. Thank you, sir. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, s